quick update to this video, guys. As I was editing and uploading it, actually progress this morning actually beat this record by another three minutes. So progress is now the world record holders for BWL with a 34 minute run. And I actually will talk about all of the new strategies that they do in another video, but I actually, I don't have enough time, unfortunately. I'm going out of town in a few minutes, but they're pretty much using all the same strategies, guys, and I will break down the new strategies that Progress uses next week, but we're also probably gonna see even more speed runs next week because the circus is just continuously going, even for the next week. People will have Darkwing Fair, so this video will have basically all of the same strategies for the most part, but progress will also have some updated strategies and I will get into all of those in my next video right when I get back. Everyone have a great weekend and I will see you all on Monday. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and today we are going to break down the brand new world record speed run from the Guild Apes in AQ40. Now today I am going to go through this entire raid and show you guys all the strategies basically that they use and kind of the thought processes behind pretty much every pull, but in the future, moving forward, I probably will be doing a lot of these guides as new guilds break these records. That's only going to focus solely on what the new mechanics or new strategies they employ. Now, the reason why I'm not going to be doing full raid reviews as much in the future right now for this particular raid is because the way Warcraft logs actually works, it doesn't really allow for that many trash skips per se. So the entire aspect of speedrunning and coming up with unique ways to get around different trash is going to be something that's going to be less prevalent within this raid, but it probably will be something that guilds still do. It's just going to depend on how we're going to do them in the future. So lastly, when I started recording today, this was going to be a video actually breaking down Salad Baker's world record run, but of course, apes beat them this morning. This footage will be from Mataz's stream. So if you don't know Mataz, he is the GM of apes, and you probably already know Mataz if you like anything about World of Warcraft, but do give him a follow, a link to his Twitch in the description. And with that said, let's get right into it. First things first, I want to break down what exactly Warcraft Logs requires to count as a run that isn't with trash skips. So in order to qualify for a complete raid ranking, you must record all nine boss kills and all the trash. The following additional requirements exist to achieve ranking without trash skips. Three Obsidian Eradicators, eight Anubisath Sentinels, six Karaji Brainwashers, six Vecnus Warriors, 29 Vecnus Guardians, six hive crawlers, six stingers, eight champions, four warders, and then also waiting on recklessness is not being allowed. So with that, basically like I mentioned earlier, is there's not really room to skip a lot of trash here, which was kind of the uniqueness in coming up with strategies for this raid originally, but nonetheless, this was an incredible run. Now if we go to the actual run itself, we can look at multiple things that are very important to kind of look at initially. The big difference between AQ40 runs and BWL runs is pretty much the prevalence of mages. So you can see that they're actually running seven mages in this run, instead of it pretty much being solely warriors. And then in here, we actually see three rogues, which is pretty average for one of those speed runs. Sometimes you might see a fourth rogue just so that every mob can be stunned on Sartura, but usually if you're running a melee, you do want them mostly to be warriors. So as with always, in a speedrun or any of the runs, the timer doesn't start until you pull the first mob, which is going to be this initial Anubisath Eradicator for pretty much every guild. The interesting thing about apes is that they initially go in to pull all of the Anubisath Sentinels right away. While they're fighting the Anubisath Eradicator, the Eradicator kind of gets melted right away, but it's really easy if you pull these early to figure out which ones you can kill, and then you can also figure out positioning them. It basically just saves time, which is crucial to a speedrun. And then we see some of the people in the group move forward to pull the next things, which is going to be your hunter. Your hunter is very key for pulling, and he's going to move forward to pull the next eradicator. Pretty much in speedruns, the big idea is just utilizing all of the time you can possibly. So you pretty much want to be pulling, chain pulling as much as possible. 
Next is ideally the next Anubisath Eradicator, but as we saw already, Apes likes to do these all together, so it's not a big deal for them. Pretty much every speedrun is going to do these all together anyways, because you can almost cleave down the Eradicator in the amount of time you're killing one of the Sentinels, or you can just focus down the Eradicator, which is usually the plan. Focus it down and then cleave one of the Sentinels that you ideally want to be killing. Apes actually spread out the Eradicator itself and then started killing the Sentinels, but they could have cleaved down the Sentinel that they needed to kill. Next is just picking which order you need to kill these. A scary thing for speedruns is actually going to be Thorns. It's a lot more scary than it is on a normal run because you have to worry about your melee killing themselves. Now, right as these Anubisath Destroyers are going down, they're going to get ready to move directly into the Prophet Scarum. So this first boss is a very simple fight where you pretty much want to kick all of the arcane explosions, but they even miss one right at the beginning. Sometimes, if you're killing this boss so fast, it can actually cast an arcane explosion while it's splitting, and it's actually impossible for you to kick it. But what they do really well here is bring in the main prophet Scarum right down to the middle so that everybody knows that's the one that's going to die last basically but that's the one that you really really need to kill so they just don't worry about bringing the prophet down before any of the actual splits die you just kill things as fast as you can and that's pretty much a standard in any speed run or in any parse run even in some slower runs you actually will see people waiting for profit scarum to bring them down the next 25 percent so that they can kill the ads so that they don't get multiple ads but in any speed run situation or any parse run or any good guild you're not really worried about that in the next pull, you always want to focus down this Brainwasher first. Ideally, you can kill it before it even does any MCs, but if it MCs someone, you guys need to watch out for your cleave. So that's actually a huge part of this raid, making sure that you're not using your cleave abilities when there is somebody actually brainwashed or MC'd on top of your group. Losing one of your melee with full world buffs, or pretty much anyone with full world buffs, to cleave is actually more of a detriment to your raid than it was to just cleave things down. So always be cautious of this, and always be vocal when somebody does get MC'd. They are going to pull this next group with the warriors, which is just an easy thing. Most guilds can do this. You can just spread them out. And this is pretty much the standard tanking position for these guardians down here you just get knocked up into the little ledge above you so that you don't get knocked really far and take a crazy amount of fall damage that is the biggest fear again they are chain pulling all of these packs so this is an easy thing as the warriors go down a smart thing for a lot of guilds and a lot of guilds do this is just have one of your tanks or any of your warriors actually do an aoe taunt so you do an AoE taunt there, and then you can lip. If you kill the warriors at the exact same time, you can AoE taunt and then lip so that you have aggro on everything, your mages can blow them up, and there's no fear of your mages getting burned down. Next is just the same thing over and over again, chain pulling the brainwashers and the guardian packs, and making sure that people aren't cleaving down whoever is being mind controlled. And as you could see, Mataz was in the back of that group, and he was attacking all of the casters, so his group was actually free to cleave for the most part. Moving into the bug trio, we are going to see that the group pretty much doesn't ever wait for mana or anything, just goes straight in, and they're going to focus on killing Princess Yuaj, and Vem is also going to be stacked on the princess, and we are not actually seeing as many people fap here, nobody's really fapping, but... You can get this fear, just hopefully you have fear ward up. If you're a horde, you have tremor totems, and you can cleave these down. It's not really a big deal, but the interesting thing is, obviously, if you cleave them, it doesn't really help out the raid overall. But if you're horde, getting cleave off actually does boost your wind fury procs if you are a warrior. And then the big thing to fear here is just that poison, right? If you kill Lord Kree and then he poisons the ground, everyone just needs to move out of it. Not a big deal at all. Kill them last and then just move on. Um, I think it's free for all so anybody could loot it, but they're pretty much not worried about anything there. It's a very standard fight for pretty much everyone. Blow it all up in whatever order you have chosen. Usually you will see the princess, then Kree, and then them. Next is the Guardian pack, which is already pre-marked, which pretty much will happen in any speedrun guild, and then they pull them into this here corner. 
The Guardian packs are one of the most interesting things within AQ. It's finding a good place where you don't get knocked into a terrible position, and that corner is really, really good for it. So you can see if I pause it right here, Mataz is tanking them pretty much right here. All of Apes is bringing them back pretty much right here. And the way they get knocked back is right up into this little ledge right behind them. So they're not getting knocked really, really far. And then here, that is a little bit scary. And honestly, even in the Salad Breakers run, some people got knocked really far. And if you are going to die, you can lip. But make sure that you know that you used your lip. This is very, very crucial. Make sure that you know you used your lip because you won't be able to use it on Battleguard Sartura. Next, they pull the next group already, right? They are never waiting. Chain pulling is, I mean, I don't know why I'm even mentioning it, but if you're doing a speed run in general, you want to chain pull. This is another really good tank spot for these mobs, and Mataz turns his camera around so he can actually see things. Some people, yeah, and I'm kind of guilty of this, will actually keep their camera set to the normal view, and you're kind of just staring at the butt of everyone else. Here, everybody's going to mount up and so that they can move on to Battleguard Sartura. Clean Sartura kills are amazing. You want a sapper, you want a stun, you want a cleave, just keep everything together. It means a whole lot. As you can see, all of the guards are stunned. All of the guards got cheap shot and then they're all going to get kidney shot as well. And... Mataz tanking the boss is going to try to bring the boss as close as he can to Sartura and the guards, but once things start spinning, you don't need to stack them up. Once it's been long enough, like if you didn't kill them before they could all start spinning, you don't really need to stack them up. For Sartura, you can chain taunt if you need to, to keep her in a certain position, pretty much away from all of your casters. And then once she's done spinning, make sure that you get your stuns off and then melee can just stay in. Right? If she enrages and starts spinning again, just use a lip, burn this boss down. Very, very simple. They cleared that really clean, but it could have been slightly cleaner if they had all of the mobs and the boss stacked the entire time. And then also on the gauntlet here, they try to run as far as they can with all of their mounts until they get to one of these soldiers. So they're pretty much always moving. A lot of guilds we will see actually will stop right when you pull a soldier, but this guild, apes, and pretty much every speed run, the group is always moving, always moving forward. You never want to be wasting time, so if you get slowed or anything like that, that's unfortunate, but you don't see on Horde, people put down totems here, and this is Alliance, obviously, so Paladins are very easy. You just want to keep moving through. This is such a simple version of the suppression room like these gauntlets here it's it's almost pointless it's just to take up more time so it's very simple they all move forward there was blast waves there and they're gonna go instantly into Fancris. there's almost no time in these speed runs for a lot of people to drink so your healers and your casters want to find all the best times to do that and also Sometimes you do possibly abuse using the Flasks of Wisdom, but whatever. Fancris has a massive aggro radius, but this is basically a tank and spank fight where people just pop off. You can see Mataz use Death Wish right away, and it's literally such a simple encounter that all you're doing really is just DPSing. You burn the boss, eventually adds will spawn. You don't use sappers here. Guys, make sure that you note this. In a speed run, do not use sappers on those ads. Nobody is going to use sappers on those ads. And the reason why nobody is going to use sappers on those ads is because you're instantly going to fight Visitus. You need to use your sappers on Visitus, obviously, to blow them up right away. So don't use sappers on Fancris. You can see that Mataz is using his normal weapons but only him, just the tank. He's using his normal weapons and normal gear just so that he can tank the boss and have full aggro. Everybody else is using their frost weapons with the icy enchant and probably frost oil. I would anticipate they all put frost oil on before the raid itself. And then the best strategies here is to split up the raid where everybody knows where they're going, get all of the globules to about half health, sap them all down, 
kill them, and then freeze the boss one more time. You actually don't need nature resistance gear and as you can see if i pause you'll see a lot of people aren't using nature as gear i don't know if anyone actually used nature as gear and i'll look in the log also but you actually don't need to use any nature resistance gear on this fight so if you're worried about that don't be just take all the poisons off yourself right away either get the venom sacks which if you don't know how to solo farm the venom sacks i made a video of that so i'll link to that in the description but you can get all of the poisons off yourself right away if you're horde all you need to do actually is just have shamans in all the groups but this is a very simple fight you don't need to really change your gear for it a lot of people do and a lot of people don't i don't think you need to change your gear for it because you can dps the globules a little bit better but you're not really worried with all of your sappers Moving straight on to the Hive Crawlers, these guys actually do a Venom Spit that you could actually use things like Grounding Totem to block, but these aren't scary mobs at all. You can chain pull them as much as you want. I'm actually surprised that they didn't chain pull those more, but these are pretty simple. It's just a very, literally, like they're just in the way and this just takes time. So ideally you could have a hunter or a hunter's pet going forward and chain pulling things back, but you do want your entire raid to be close to these things. So just kill those two right away, those two packs. So as they mount up and move into these next hive crawlers, this is almost perfect positioning because then you can pull these hive crawlers and chain pull. This is the area where we're gonna see a ton of chain pulling. So as they're killing these crawlers, they have their puller right there doing all of the chain pulling. And as they're gonna kill this first group, which is a really easy group, there's only one singer and three wasps, they're gonna pull the next group. Now the scary thing here, a couple things are scary. The poisons are scary, so if you get marked and then you get insta-gibbed, it's scary. But the lashers, get the lashers out of the group so that nobody has to lip. They're gonna start with cleaving the lashers down as much as possible, but you pretty much just kill the stingers right away as you can and then kill the wasps. These groups are very simple and as always, it's pretty much a standard thing each time. They are gonna chain pull these a lot, but again, you'll notice they pull the lasher out of the group. The lasher is the ad that pretty much looks like Battleguard Sartura. They just need to get that out because it's going to do a whirlwind and cleave everyone for a good amount of damage, especially if they are double pulling these like they just did. So these pulls, again, very simple, not that scary, lots of cleave, and they're going to move forward. There is one more of these groups within Huhuron's room, and what they're pretty much doing is sending their hunter forward to get it so that they can initiate the fight before the rest of the raid group gets there. And the chain pulling in this raid, if your hunter is really good and if your raid is ready, the scary thing about chain pulling here is if your raid isn't ready to pick up the right adds and you don't have other warriors, backup warriors to pick up adds, or if you don't have people that are going to move the lasher out, you could lose people. But it's pretty simple. Moving into Princess Huron again, the same thing as Visitus where nobody uses nature resistance. Nobody uses nature resistance. Matos to get snap threat right at the beginning is going to use Earth Strike combined with Death Wish. This is pretty standard for any tank here and everybody is not really afraid of the nature damage. The only thing that can suck is getting slept. The sleep is really annoying and they didn't use bear peasant collars or anything like that cheesy if you're the person that gets slept there's nothing really you can do about it moving into the anubisaf defenders now these are one of the scarier pulls in here if your group is not prepared or doesn't know exactly what they're doing but it's really easy to do as you can see there was a shadow bolt right there initial shadow bolt so everybody is called to move in it's so simple if you have fast raid calls where everybody is just called to move in you're going to see the hunter is creeping forward he is on the side of the mob that is closer to the next one because the hunter is going to be the person pulling in any of these speed runs, you're going to see, especially with apes, because they're really good at stacking up. They've just always been probably like the best guild in the world at staying stacked whenever they need to. You're going to see them move at whatever pace they need to. Another Shadow Bolt volley and it's Meteor, so they move in. 
The scary thing on that pull is that some people like Naru over here still has the poison or the plague. And so he needs to stand outside of the group. And the, fe the fear here is getting hit by a meteor while you are standing outside of the group. But, but the plague's range is like five yards. So you could stand pretty close and you won't actually scuff yourself in those situations. As I was saying, you do actually see their hunter move in between Naru and the boss so that if the meteor is on Naru, he can absorb some of the damage. But the big brain play we're going to see here, luckily Naru is a rogue, is he's going to vanish bash the meteor. He actually times it out perfectly too. Watch his health. Vanish. Vanishes the meteor. Doesn't get one shot, which is incredible huge play by Nero there and so next is the explosion on these mobs and as it explodes you just want to make sure that your group is moving forward towards the next one here we have a thunderclap so you'll see all of the ranged move out this group is so fast at call out on this and right as you saw the first thunderclap everybody moved out your raid should be just as fast but call outs are very helpful they don't really do anything special here, so I do want to move forward through this part very fast, but I just wanted to mention what you want to be focused on on those packs, all of the things that are very important. Again, he does have the plague here. You'll see Mataz has the plague, and so he won't be main tanking this mob. You still can actually main tank the mob and stand on the opposite side of the rest of your group if you need to. You'll be out of range but he's just gonna stand off by himself until his plague goes away. Moving straight into Twin Emps, we're gonna see the group split up, the ranged and the melee split up to their respective bosses, and right away, they're actually going to have their Warlock tank casting. So the actual melee boss is gonna be moving towards the ranged group initially, but just have a hunter hit it once and then pull it towards the tank. The tank can get aggro from that, but it's annoying or it can be annoying as a tank to get a little bit of initial snap aggro here if you don't run in at the exact same time as your Warlock casting. And you could cast Blood Rage right at the beginning also, which can give you a little bit of threat or some of your shouts. So you can see Mataz uses a shout right at the beginning, battle shout right at the beginning, which does give a little bit of snap threat. But the hunter pulling the boss to him is the real big play here. Now he's backing it away and there's no one near him on threat. He is absolutely incredible with threat and tanking these. And also Alliance doesn't really have to worry about threat at all. You can see that their positioning is a little bit to the left of the torches so that the actual run distance between the two bosses is shorter for the melee. The ideal thing here is to have the shortest run distance for the melee and your casters also so that they can get onto the other mob as it switches to DPS again. The fear of course is if something gets out of position and then it starts healing so you just really want to be careful with this. Next we're also going to see him pretty much just eat the teleport explosion and you're gonna see ZN get all of this snap threat. XN, XN, sorry. XN is really incredible at getting this snap threat right away. And Mataz or your other tank is just waiting for the teleport to happen again. He's pretty much just sitting here getting ready for teleport to happen again. And as it's coming up soon, he's gonna move in and get snap threat. So you can see that he's closer to anyone else. There's no pets on the mob. And he's also in between the mob or the boss and the rest of his raid. So that if it did bug and he didn't get initial threat, he can grab it right away. But he is on this boss right away, DPSing it before it even starts moving and just getting snap threat. If your tanks are good and position themselves well or just good in general, then you're not gonna have issues with positionings on these bosses. So this boss is very simple if your tanks can understand or get down the tanking mechanics and also pretty much just hold aggro. It's very simple if your tanks can hold aggro really well and this includes your Warlock tank. You can see that Emperor Vecklor did move there and XN is going to actually get aggro soon 
but it did take a little bit. So 10, who probably had the Ignite stack on the other side, did have aggro initially. So you can be careful with this. Some guilds like to have their Ignite stacks actually drop before the teleport. But if you're doing a speed run and bursting things down as fast as possible, you just need your Warlock to have incredible snap threat, which XN does. The guild keeps 10 up while he's taking those initial shadow bolts until XN grabs aggro and they can move forward. Next is the post twin emps trash, which is pretty annoying most of the time, but it's very simple. You'll usually see hunter pets do the pulling here. So they have hunter pets that move in, especially with this range, the tubby with the screech goes in and pulls the mobs. This is pretty much standard positioning for tanking all of these mobs. You just want to pull them out of this room, mainly because the other pats in there can move really close to you and you don't want to patrol on top of anything. Also, you don't want to get feared into the next pats. So chain pulling still is crucial here, but you do not want to accidentally pull multiple things. You'll also notice that the hunter is still up here getting ready to pull the next group. He's always ready to pull the next group. Your puller is one of the most important jobs in the entire game. Moving forward, they have two packs together and Metaz actually makes a call for them to pull both. Right now they are waiting for the packs to separate and by the time that Tubster gets up there to pull them, they did separate perfectly, but usually pulling two of these packs can mean death for most guilds. But if you're in a guild like Apes, you're in one of the top guilds in the world, you're initially gonna make callouts so fast that you can pull two of these and not kill yourselves. As you can see, this other group is padding back right there and people are getting feared towards them, but they don't actually get pulled all the way over there. Another thing as usual, as I mentioned earlier, is if your friends or if you're fighting any of the Mind Slayers and you have people that are MC'd, don't cleave things down. I'm actually kind of surprised that Apes doesn't use the strategy of killing all of the Mind Slayers at the exact same time so you can batch it and only get feared one time. There's nothing you can really do unless you resist the fear, but you can batch it if you kill all of them at the exact same time, then you can batch it where only one fear really goes off because it doesn't really double fear you if one dies while you're already being feared or terror or whatever it is but if it does happen that's a whole eight seconds of basically being incapacitated so a good strategy is to kill these down at the exact same time to batch them down and apes does have the coordination to be able to do that so they could pull that off i'm surprised they don't use that strat so i skipped forward a little bit because that room is pretty standard you're not really going to see anything change too much because we can't really do that many trash skips as i mentioned earlier the only thing that's gonna change between different raids is the composition of the groups because there's a little bit of RNG there. This is the next room where we're gonna see some actual chain pulling again, where you're gonna pull the nullifiers. You can cleave these down really fast. So it's not something to be actually scared about. And then you can kill the warder. So the nullifiers, look at how fast they die. They literally can get deleted. You might see some people actually draining mana on the second one, the X target, but you don't really need to do that because you can chain pull these and burn them down so fast. And then the next group is being pulled before this warder is even dead. And all of the melee DPS or most of the melee DPS is already moving towards the nullifier before this warder is even dead because the warders aren't really scary in this raid. You don't really have to worry about them killing you for the most part. And if the nullifier did get to max mana, it would kill pretty much the entire raid. So don't let that happen. So I skip forward once again after that, pretty much because the next pulls are basically the exact same thing. You can't really skip anything. So they're gonna initially move in to fight Oro. Mataz gets knocked back, so he's not going to be the person main tanking the initial part of this boss fight. And he has 80 rage, so he's actually not swapping to Berserker Sands and intercepting back in he will eventually build threat again staying in defensive stance as you can see he is really high up on threat and he's actually going to get the entire raid sandblasted here which is pretty sketchy but 
you do see now where Vips is the second highest on threat, Vipsy, and he actually runs out of range of the knockback, so he's not the person getting sandblasted and losing threat. And then he charges back in so that he has top threat and is now the new tank. This fight is basically a similar situation to Twin M's where if you have decent job on the tank swaps, you're not really have to fear anything. It's literally another tank and spank if your tanks can swap correctly. And you could lip a knockback. As a rogue, you could evasion and dodge a knockback here, and you can also vanish a knockback. So everyone should kind of be aware of that. You probably won't need vanish until later into the C'Thun fight. So vanishing a knockback on a rogue is really, really good because you're also going to drop all of your threat just by doing that. And then last but not least is the big bad C'Thun himself, where we're going to see the group all group up initially, and the main tank, Adia, Adia is going to run in now, and everybody's going to wait for that, and then just move in. I'm always asked by people why um, everybody can move in and not worry about them grabbing aggro or actually the I-beam switching, and that's mostly because one Adia is going to run in and then he's going to use his Blood Rage. But also, you're going to see nobody get off their mounds. Nobody is using any abilities. You can't use any abilities because sometimes it can actually bug the actual eye where Cthulhu will turn to you guys and I beam you. Just nobody use any abilities until you're in position and then start attacking the boss. It's very, very simple. Once everybody is in position, then you don't have to worry about anything. The pull is the scariest part of Cthulhu for guilds that don't have it down. But other than that, this boss is really, really easy. As long as you rotate properly and are in the best positioning, but you don't actually even need to rotate in any speed run, you're going to kill Cthulhu right here before he finishes his I-beam. The interesting thing that we're seeing from apes is that they are on the side of the boss that is the opposite side of the entrance. And almost every other guild you'll see will be at the opposite side of the boss for phase two. This side of the boss, you can still get parried. So on this side of the boss, we'll probably see Meitaz get some parries when they actually make the boss vulnerable to actual damage. Here's the first eye tentacle, and the eye tentacle, or the big eye tentacle, when it does spawn, you can just burn it down. It's really simple. And then they're actually going to be slightly slow on killing the inside tentacles to the point of there's going to be one more giant tentacle. The giant tentacle is going to spawn right as the boss gets vulnerable. And what we're going to see is it actually gets picked up and tanked. One thing you could do is rotate target dummies on that eye tentacle or the giant claw tentacle so that your tank doesn't die but the focus here is burning Cthulhu. If you kill Cthulhu then you actually will just have the giant tentacle despawn. The ranged are busy killing the eye tentacles, the little eye tentacles for the most part and right there as you can see Meitaz does get parried. He was getting parried over here and even when he positions over here where he is right now he's still going to get parried. So ideally, he would be right at the entrance to the room. Right here, as you're going to see, this is usually the backstab rogues or pretty much everyone. So he does still get parried, which probably could have slowed down their kill ever so slightly. They burn the boss, get the world's fastest run, and the giant tentacle despawns. And that is that guys that is the world's fastest clear of aq40 37 minutes and two seconds of course this was done by the guild apes which has many many world first achievements one of the best guilds in the world huge congrats to them again this was all footage from Meitaz's stream if you liked this video please make sure to like and subscribe you can come hang out with me on twitch at twitch.tv slash sarth as well if you have any questions about the raid or if you want to see me do the raid myself my guild won't be doing speed runs this circus so just wait for that but Anyways, congratulations to Apes, guys. This was a great, great run. Very, very clean. And as always, they just are an incredible guild. I'll see you guys all on the next one, and good luck out there.